Hello, everyone. This is Terry with Futures IO, and as always, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome Peter Davies from Jigsaw Trading for today's webinar, Situational Awareness. Throughout the webinar, if you have a question, please feel free to type them into the questions box. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the Futures.io website within 24 to 48 hours. If you're watching us afterwards on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the webinar. And as always, please feel free to share, comment, subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, and information, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using at Futures.io. Uh, please bear with us due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Most of us are working from home, and so you may hear small children or animals in the background. And now, without further delay, I will hand it over to Peter, and you'll get the pop-up to share your screen again. Okay, let me just sort the, the screen share out. Two seconds, people, because uh, I usually mess this up. Okay. Right, you should all see my screen now. Is that okay, Terry? Yes, sir. Looks good. She's all yours. Okay, that's brilliant. Right, so today we're going to look at um, something we call situational awareness or how to understand how much opportunity there is on any given trading day, right? Now, in the professional world, it's kind of taken for granted that daily returns from trading are quite inconsistent. So a professional trader wouldn't expect to make the same amount of money each day. Um, in fact, the job of a professional trader is really to take advantage of whatever opportunity the market actually gives them each day. And it varies day to day. So today, we'll show you some of the things that are used every day by quite a lot of professional traders to help them understand how much opportunity is in the market. And many professional traders would not trade without this. And of course, there's lots of different kinds of professional traders, and I can't pretend to cover everything. Um, this isn't all going to be new to you. But using information this way might be new. Um, and they're give you, going to give you what we call situational awareness to ensure you make the most of the opportunity each day provides and you minimize the losses on the days that simply don't provide much opportunity at all. And as usual, we're not just going to talk about what to look at, we're going to talk about why. So if you've ever had something, uh, a technique that worked and just stopped working, probably down to a, lot, a lack of situational awareness. Now, one of the challenges of teaching this is it does fly in the face of some common misconceptions a lot of new traders believe. So when people first look at trading, they read, you know, because it's everywhere, that they're going to find one system for all markets on all time frames in all market conditions, a system they can buy today and profit from tomorrow and ever, something that requires no work at all on their behalf, and it's probably going to cost them about $47. So what we're going to talk about today is the opposite of that. Right, we're going to talk about something that's going to give us an insight into the level of institutional participation. Right, so this chart here illustrates the fluctuations in participation in the market. The light blue here represents the retail traders, the guys at home. The darker blue are the institutions. And you can see that retail trade is really quite steady because people just sit down and trade every day, mostly because with low situational awareness, most home traders they just sit down and trade every day without really much thought to how much opportunity there exists on that day. Now, when institutions get involved with the markets, they bring in volume, they bring in movement. They might be getting into new positions because they feel a longer term change in the market is likely. They might be getting out positions because they feel an opportunity is uh, over. They might be hedging existing positions. They might be hedging their business. It could be Kellogg's locking in the price of corn because of bad weather outlooks or an anticipated peak in cornflake consumption. It uh, could be airlines hedging uh, fuel prices. It uh, could be system-wide, could be market-specific. And it's not unusual for a number of institutions to all act at the same time. So if you go back to 87, we had a, a, a crash that was called the Black Monday crash, and that was caused by something known as portfolio insurance. And that was a strategy designed to reduce losses when prices went down. It was really, really very clever. It would work to treat. Trouble was, it wasn't such a great idea when everyone was doing it at the same time. So all of these institutions had this strategy in place and they all ended up doing exactly the same thing at the same time and crashing the market. And then as it went down, their rules for portfolio insurance told them to sell even more as it crashed. And even now, the things that make institutions react is going to hit a lot of them all at the same time, right? So all airlines hedge fuel costs, but so do lots of transportation shipping companies. So an event that looks like it's going to change oil prices dramatically is going to hit a lot of companies all at once. 
Hence, we see these peaks of activity, peaks that provide the smaller trader at home with opportunity. Now, the lessons of 87 have been learned. Institutions want to adjust positions without moving price too much, like they did in the Black Monday crash. So let's say somebody needs to offload 100 million shares in Apple. They don't just put a single sell market order in for 100 million shares. They'd crash the price of the stock, right? They get really bad prices. So they have to work their position over time, trying to minimize the impact of their selling. It could take a day, could take several days. But they can't completely neutralize the impact of their selling, but they can minimize it. So when a market moving event occurs, you don't just see prices move from one level to another level in 10 seconds, right? It can take hours, it can take days, which is great for us because we can exploit the moves that are created. Now, sometimes the buying or selling is a little less orderly and people aren't really trying to get out without uh, minimizing their impact. If you look at the recent COVID-19 sell-off, that's an example of very motivated selling or panic selling, right? With everybody running for the doors at the same time. Some great moves, but really very wild. So on the days where we have good participation by institutions, there is more opportunity for small traders like us riding the momentum, giving us good intraday swings, a nice, lively, bubbly market. Now, what happens if you take away that institutional participation? Think about it. What are we left with? Well, what are we left with if it's a really low volume day where there's not really any institutional participation? You're left with a bunch of retail traders all trying to make money off each other. Of course, there's going to be more than that, but just, just trying to simplify it. So you get a day where there's very, very little opportunity. The markets still kind of move around a little bit. We still have candlesticks drawing on the charts, but the actual opportunity to make money is way down. So what does your average retail trader try and do on those days? Well, what they tend to do is just carry on exactly the same, applying exactly the same type of strategy, but they initially lose money and they lose money for the simple fact that there's actually very little opportunity in the market, right? So what do they do when they lose that money? Well, then they try to win it back often increasing the number of contracts. So the size goes up, they're trying to win the money back, but the opportunity is not there. Next thing you know, no more account. Hence this absolutely brilliant phrase that came from a professional trader, and I know it's probably about a year and a half ago. Uh, nobody told the seagulls there was just one French fry in the parking lot. Too many people chasing too little money. Now, majority of traders completely ignore what we're gonna talk about today um, for a number of reasons. Uh, many of them, though, because a lot of people have a very, very firm belief that everything is in the charts. And the reason they have that firm belief is because, you know, when they started out and they go to websites and they go to, to books uh, for Amazon.com or whatever, that's what they read. Everything's in the charts. Still, it is pretty clear that Donald Trump tweets aren't in the charts. COVID-19 wasn't in the charts. Brexit wasn't in the charts. But all of those things have been shaping the way our market, markets move. Now, you do have some people that use some components of situational awareness, right? So in absence of news, they feel the market's more predictable. If you look at companies like Top Step, they tell people don't trade close to the news, right? That is a use of situational awareness, right? Um, so they feel that the market is actually predictable a lot of the time, but then when news comes in, it becomes uh, less predictable, which is true. But that kind of initial reaction that you get off news is not the sum total of the reaction, right? We know that liquidity gets pulled ahead of the news. And we know that after the news, we tend to get that flurry of activity. But that doesn't mean after that initial flurry of activity that the news has been absorbed and everybody's done what they need to do, right? So lots of news events, unemployment numbers, FOMC, they're followed by several minutes of volatility. And it gives the impression that when it quietens down, the reaction's over, right? Um, so, you know, we see people that get flat before a news release, wait for that initial rush of after news activity to end, and then they just go back to exactly the same thing they were doing before the news, right? So they, they are kind of being aware of what's going on in the market, but they're not really using it to impact their strategy. Now, both of those groups are going to struggle with consistently because things that work one day don't work the next, right? So when the markets change, they have no way to make adjustments. And, and none of this is rocket science, right? Um, but their trading is a bit like a car without steering wheel. It only goes in a straight line. Now, there are other traders that understand 
there is a different amount of opportunity each day and then it can actually change through the day. Um, they get that this is going to impact the size of moves, it's going to impact the size of their stops. Um, but these people who do this stuff that we look at today, they're not really spending a lot more time uh, doing stuff, they've just got a process to follow that ensures they're actually getting the most out of the market when it's there and not doubling down uh, to win back losses when it isn't. So the components we're going to look at today, probably going to be very obvious, but we're going to just put a little bit of a different slant on them, uh, are these. We look at news, market norms, recent activity, technical factors. There's a lot of different kinds of news that we need to go through. So we'll go through these one by one. And if you decide that this is something that you might, you might look back at your trade and say, you know, this might be what's missing for me, or this might be why I'm having those really poor days sometimes and really good days other times. Um, just throw all of this in. This isn't the kind of thing you need to master one thing at a time. Uh, it's not really that complicated. It's uh, just a matter of adding a few things to your radar each day. Um, so we're going to go through each, how to incorporate them uh, and, and how to get maximum benefit. Right. So the first thing we're going to look at is news events. Now, we know that the markets, certainly in the past three or four years, have been really reactive to news. The whole Brexit phase, you know, which is pretty quiet now, but it's kind of uh, it's been put on the back burner by COVID, but it will come to the front when COVID goes away. Um, the first type of news that everybody looks like looks at is the scheduled economic releases. So that's very common. There's websites that show it. Um, that there are scheduled releases that usually like government numbers, that kind of thing that come out. Every country has them. Um, this and, and lots of platforms have them. This is actually the Jigsaw Day Trader platform. Um, and it's basically you have news. News is generally rated like green, red, yellow here by the impact, but any any news that really misses can hit the market um, quite wildly. Um, higher impact news tends to see the market thin out and move drastically before the news. We've all seen this. Uh, basically, market makers are getting out of the way ahead of an announcement, uh, just a, a risk reduction uh, play on their part. And then when the results come in, they're either going to be in line, above or below expectations. Now, it could be a big miss or it could be way ahead of expectations. And there are traders out there that track every one of these events and how it reacts to a particularly good or bad number, right? It's not very difficult to do, but it's not my thing, to be honest. Um, but it doesn't actually take much to record for each event whether we were above, below, or way above, or way below, and what kind of reaction the market put in. And a lot of people do that also for stock earnings reports, uh, because some stocks, you know, when they do their quarterly report, they have um, like their expectations that they put out before the, the real numbers come out, you know, they put them out the weeks before, and some stocks will routinely report low expectations and then beat those expectations each quarter. And for a lot of those stocks, there's a very typical reaction when they do that. And again, I know a trader who had four full-time researchers compiling this data about all of the stocks, the earning stocks, so that in earnings season, he had expectations for each stock reporting earnings every day. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this. That's basically a complete trading approach in its own right. Uh, but what we're talking about today is using the same kind of data to just enhance your trading. But it does highlight, highlight the fact that the moves after a specific release, they're just not as random as they appear, right? There's traders looking to trade each release a specific way based on a hit and miss, quite often they're disappointed because they get a hit or a miss and the market doesn't react. But they're just looking to trade the typical reaction. Now we, uh, and again, a lot of websites you can see, we, we highlight the T, uh, most significant release in red, that's kind of common. Um, there are some releases that are obviously higher impact on the markets than others, um, like the crude oil inventories can be very uh, impactful on crude. Um, and what we see is that initial reaction lasts a few minutes, it's quite normal. But after that, as the news is digested, what do we see? Well, if employment numbers, typically if employment numbers miss by a quarter of a million, that would be a pretty big miss and the market could end up reacting to that for the entire day. Now, we also know that in the COVID era, the market will probably shrug that off. So everything that you do is kind of put into perspective and you always need to carry what's been happening like recently along with you. So if you're watching the employment numbers and you're seeing the employment numbers go up by 30 million with COVID and the market barely reacting, you know that probably next week if we miss by 250,000, it's probably not gonna be that big a deal, okay? So everything's kind of contextual and you just have to kind of follow these stories. If you follow football or you follow hockey or whatever you follow, it's just as easy as doing that, 
right? Just, just reading about something every week, it'll stick in your head, right? So if we do have a big miss, we can end up reacting to that for the entire day. Um, doesn't really matter what those first initial fast moves are. What we are looking is whether the overall picture has changed. Now, the second type of news is the unscheduled news. It's news that comes out of the blue. Now, there are some regulations on what people are allowed to say during market hours, right? But that relates mostly to the stock markets. And there are rules to prevent people pushing out fake news to move a stock, for example. Um, it's the reason a lot of this news is scheduled, so people get it all at the same time, stop people from cheating, basically. So you can see that on this day, it was a big uh, day for crude. It was in the news a lot. Um, so oil news itself is going to affect the price of oil. It's going to affect the price of oil, or other markets as well, right? Because it impacts transportation costs. So even if you're not trading oil, oil's a good one to have on your radar, right? So there will be times when your market puts in a sudden move for no apparent reason. You didn't break a range. You didn't push for an old high. You just see a sudden move from nowhere. When that happens, the first thing you should do is check the news, right? Now, if you're watching crude oil, it's pretty normal for the for crude oil to have a blow off. It can happen like three or four or five times a day, where it just blows off and takes off in one direction. It's just a volume spike, right? It's just people getting a bit overexcited. Now, that happens quite a lot, but sometimes it's the news. So if you see a big news from, move from nowhere, check your news feed, and it's going to help you decide if the resulting move is likely to be a sustained one. So if you consider a recent example, um, crude started moving really fast. Trader A thinks everything's in the charts. Trader B goes to the news and sees that an oil refiner in Saudi has just been hit with missiles. Right? Which of those traders is now in the best position to make a decision about how to trade that? And it's obviously the guy who knows about the missiles in Saudi. Now, that is a kind of rare piece of news, but that moved that market all day, right? You could have just, you could have just got into that market, scaled into a position, and had one of your best days ever, right? But if you had just focused on the charts and just didn't take that second to just go and look at your news feed, um, you're going to miss out on it, okay? So Trader A, all he's going to have is his one system for all markets in all conditions. And he's just going to be able to do the same thing he does all the time. Trader B is going to know this is probably going to be a big move. It's likely to impact the markets for the rest of the day, probably a few days, right? He'll also know it's probably going to be a bit wild, right? So when you get a market that's hit by something like that, it's not that easy to get in, right? You can't say, well, this market's going up. I'm going to wait for a pullback. You know, that's just not realistic, right? Expecting a nice orderly pullback to get into that move, it's just not going to happen. So quite often you're going to have to do things like scale into a position, start small and actually try and build the position as the market goes. If you can't trade crude because it's a bit too big for you in that volatility, then maybe go to the index futures because they're surely going to be hit by this. And you could trade the micros and try and scale into that if you're a one lot trader. Um, now, of course, you might see changing oil prices for lesser reasons, maybe government lifting restrictions on drilling. And with this news, market isn't going to really expect a, a lot of additional risk if it's just a small area they're opening drilling to. It might impact prices a little bit. Um, you know, so sometimes you're going to get news which is kind of minor and isn't going to make that big a difference. It's news, it's out, a little bit of a reaction this time. But with this kind of bomber refinery news, um, there's risk of additional bombs. There's maybe um, a risk of conflict. Um, there's, there's all kinds of risks, um, and it just takes a little common sense and experience to understand why this news might cause people to react. And then there's just the plain the old vanilla blow off in crude moves that occur a few times a day, and they're not at all news driven, right? They look a bit the same at the start, right? You see a volume blow off in crude, you see the a crude being hit by news, it's going to look a little bit the same at the start, but if you go to the news, it'll help you kind of confirm and maybe think a little bit more about how sustained that move is going to be, right? Because, but all the time in thinner markets like crude, we get that little bit of overexcitement. As volume spikes uh, come in, people think they've missed out on a move, piling on, on a move, and it just comes through a dramatic end. So check the news. Um, if there's nothing there, you basically stay off. You don't join in. And you can keep checking the news if it comes in. Your news feed might be a bit delayed. Um, and just make sure that, you know, you're on the right side and that you're getting into moves that are likely to be sustained. Now, the third type of news, and this is one that lots of people don't look at, right? It's not real-time news. 
and it's not an economic release. And it's usually um, it's usually like some sort of press conference where something is being announced, right? Or it could be a speech, right? The ones where something is being announced are usually better because you've kind of got a clue of which markets are going to be impacted. If it's just like a speech by a politician, it's it's a little bit difficult to um, to, to judge. So you know you get these press conferences that happen all the time. They are allowed to happen while the market's open about things like trade agreements, right? Uh, during Brexit, there were a lot of Brexit-related press press conferences over the past three or four years. Um, no one's interested in it now, but it will re return as a market mover as COVID dies out. Um, this image in particular uh, is from summer 2019. And this one, it might sound a bit dull actually, but was an announcement on beef exports to Europe, right? The contents of this announcement were not known in advance, but we knew it was about beef exports, right? Because it was, you know, you, you knew who was attending. Um, there was a, a whatever the beef organizations in the US, you know, these all these these farmers here. Um, so we got Trump, a bunch of cowboys, and a cowboy, a cowgirl up on TV live. Now, during these events, prop traders are sitting there listening. It gets very tense in a prop firm just when one of these um, events is coming up. So what you'll see in a, in a firm is you'll see a bunch of traders are sitting there like 20, 30 minutes before it comes out. They'll be chatting about, you know, what do you think is going to happen and, and how are you going to play it? And they won't all be playing, planning to play the same market. Some guy might say, well, I'm going to, you know, trade a current pay, currency trade. Somebody might be trading beef. And they'll all have a chat about um, how they're going to play it. And then the closer you get to the announcement, the quieter and more tense it gets in the room. Okay. So they're listening. Now, one of the things um, they get that you don't in the prop firms, you don't know, you probably don't realize this, but when you're watching something like this on CNN, there is a slight delay, right? And it's not an intentional delay, but it just takes time for the satellite feed to get to the TV station, to go through all the things they need to do, and for it to get pushed out to TV. So in the prop firms, they've actually got about a 15-second advantage on the audio. They don't have an advantage on the video, but they can get audio feeds that are just basically coming a more direct route to the prop firm. They don't have to be cleaned up and made nice and flipped from one camera to another camera, right? So they're, they're a lot faster. So, but it is only a 15 second advantage, right? And we're not talking about, and they're not planning to make 15 second trades. They are planning to make bigger trades, but they're looking to get a, a slight edge uh, over the guy at home. So, as I say, by the time the announcement comes out, you don't want to make a sound in a prop firm. <laughs> it's like being in a library or being in, a, in, a, in an exam. Um, if you make a, a sound, you'll get your head bitten off. And then the announcement starts. And the funny thing about these announcements, it's not like uh, an economic release or a news headline that comes out where you're like, bang, you know what's going on. They start with a bunch of fluff. A bunch of people come on, shake hands. Somebody goes on first, introduces the main speaker. Um, but at some point, the kind of crux or the meat of the issue is going to come out, right? And, and in this case, Europe lifted a ban on US beef imports. And that meant billions of dollars of beef going to Europe, okay? And the moment that comes out, that is when the market's going to react, right? Or not. I mean, in this case, I was actually sitting in a prop firm at the time, and everybody was getting up, and you could just feel that tension, and the release came out, and absolutely nothing happened. It was just dead and that, sometimes that happens right but these meetings they're really good for generating moves and not a lot of people are really aware of them you know they might be aware you know you get home at the end of the day and you see it but you're not really aware that people are actually sitting there and reacting to this um they use your headline news on uh, financial media sites so forbes financial times reuters but the best way to look at these is there are some free newsletters that go out in the morning and what they'll do is they'll break down what the meetings are for that day. So these two here, I recommend this one, Bloomberg.com. Uh, they've got a newsletter page. It's one called Five Things to Start Your Day. It is the best one for like the retail trader. It costs you nothing. And it will just give you like a schedule of what's going on in that day. Right. So um, I don't know if Terry can put those in the chat or the Q&A somewhere. Um, or, or I might be able to do that later. Okay, so these are really cool because they're events that happen through the day. They're going to send your market into a tailspin if you don't know about them. 
Um, so just please be aware. And then you've got bigger stories, right? China trade wars, Brexit, COVID, all that kind of thing. And the one I find the most bizarre and the most amusing was Brexit, right? Because it went on for so long. Uh, it's the longest macroeconomic news event I've ever seen. And what was so interesting about Brexit is that every few days we'd hear news about Brexit and the market would react to that news. And it's funny because the market was effectively acting as if this piece of news somehow was indicative of the final event, right? So over and over, the latest news would push in a, push in a different direction. So Brexit would be on, then it would be off, then it was on, then it was referendum, was we're going to have a ref, second referendum, then we weren't going to have a second referendum, and then we were, then UK was going to be in the customs union, and then not in the customs union, and in and out, and in and out. And doing all these news releases, the market kept reacting. But there wasn't, I don't think there was a single person that actually believed any of these news releases were, were final. And so one of the weird things about this, as you watch it, all I can say is I can't explain this. I can't explain why the market reacts as if this is it. On, on sagas like Brexit, but you know there are some reactions. You know the, there's a there's a pro Brexit move and an ex anti Brexit move in the market. And as the news comes out, it generates moves. Not every Brexit news generates moves. What kind of big things or the things that the, the market considers big things, they make the moves. Will you know necessarily what the market considers a big thing? Absolutely not. Right. So to me, it's almost kind of a random thing. It's, it's kind of an on and off, but there is some obviously some more nuanced analysis in the markets of these events where the market does react. And it's not really necessary to predict the reaction, but it's good to know the market is reacting to news so you can jump on it. Um, China trade, exactly the same. It was just China and, uh, and the US beating their chest, right? We had more tariffs, then we have an agreement, then we were falling out again, and more tariffs and agreements and over and over and over again, right? With the market just reacting to it again, as if it was somehow final. Now, I can't explain why the market keeps reacting to that latest story as if it has a bear, bearing on the final outcome. It just does, right? But it does give traders the opportunity to predict both additional participation in the market as a result of the news and give them a chance to switch strategies, right? Now, COVID's a little different. Um, other long-running macro stories move the markets, but didn't crash the markets. COVID did crash the markets, generated a bit too much volatility for traders. So with bigger events like that, you have kind of the story creating news, plus when the market crashes, you've got all these kind of governments panicking, all these counter, counter moves that go on, the kind of series of predictable events, the crashes, interest rate drops, short selling gets banned. We didn't see a short selling ban yet, but maybe we will if it moves down again. We get bailouts, we get bankruptcies, we get unemployment, and then eventually we start to recover, right? So those macro stories kind of run on a long time and they're the gifts that keep giving, right? Once again, you don't have to be one of the first traders to trade the news, right? You just need to pay attention to what the news is. Is it positive or negative? Uh, and what's a typical reaction, right? So you can trade, you don't have to trade the first couple of minutes, but you can trade that larger, slower reaction. Um, but if you're not even aware of the news, you're not gonna know why the market's um, just gone in a tailspin. Well, okay, so why is this important? Because surely everything you need to know is in the charts, or surely you need to just buy the right system to make money in every time frame, in every market, in all conditions. And this is where we cycle back to understanding opportunity, right? This is one of the most important aspects of your trading strategy. So if you're only gonna learn one thing today, it needs to be this. You can't make the same amount of money every day. It's not possible, right? If your goal is $1,000 a day, forget it. If your goal is to average $1,000 a day, that's absolutely realistic, right? I know prop traders that on good days can make hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Other days, they might make or just lose a couple of thousand, right? And that's simply because on some days, there's more opportunity than others, right? Um, they may start the day uh, with some idea or some kind of prediction of how much opportunity might be available, 
Um, but it's not always clear, right? You're not always going to get like an on-off switch. So if you start watching all this news and stuff, um, you're not going to know with absolute certainty whether today is going to give you something or not. And for a lot of prop traders, what they do is they'll trade a little, they'll lose a bit of money, and they'll decide that, yes, it does look like the market isn't providing opportunity. And then they stop with that small loss. And these are elite traders, best in the industry, losing a couple of thousand dollars on a slow day. Now, what does a trader at home do in that same situation? Well, if they're thinking in terms of, I'm gonna make $500 a day and stop, on the low opportunity days, they're not gonna make that $500, right? They're gonna make a few losses. They don't consider that those losses are simply, oh, sorry, let's go back. They don't consider that those losses are just a reflection of the fact there's really not much opportunity in the market, right? So they carry on and they try to make the losses back, often by increasing trade size. And of course, on a day where there is little opportunity, the only possible outcome of trying to make back your losses is actually making more losses, right? Often digging a hole until the account is empty. So on dead days, you're gonna take trades on a, a more lively day, you're gonna get into trade and there's gonna be a bit of a pop in the market. You know, like when a range breaks, right? But on a really low opportunity day, range is gonna break, a few ticks, nothing happens, just falls back in. Markets barely lift a few ticks from your entry. There's kind of no energy, no direction. And those are the days where you feel a bit of an idiot, right? We all have days where we trade and we just feel like we can't do anything wrong. And then we get these other days where we just feel like we don't know anything at all. It's like you don't know anything about the how the markets work because everything you do is wrong. And that's not really the case. It's just you're missing that important part of the picture, the fact that it's just not good condition to make money. There's nothing bringing in participation. Now, you probably all know this. One day you feel like you're finally master trading. Next day, you realize you haven't. And it's not the strategy. It's just the amount of opportunity. Now, for us retail traders, one of the issues when you think about stuff like this, it's very difficult to relate to the sort of size trading in our markets on the institutional side, right? The, the amount of money to be made and lost and the, the urgency with which participants may need to trade. Because really what we're talking about is urgency, right? Urgency in people holding positions, as well as people not yet holding positions that wanna get in. So let's just consider a real world example. And this is like a current example. Um, when I first created these slides a couple of weeks ago, um, oil was $23 a barrel, right? Now, there are a few airlines, there's a lot of airlines that hedge fuel costs. Um, they can hedge them in lots of different ways. Um, they can hedge them with the actual jet fuel. Some people do it with um, swaps. Some people do it with uh, oil contracts. It doesn't really matter how they're doing it, but basically it's all about oil prices, right? Uh, you know, when people hedge fuel, it's all about oil prices. So as of April the 1st this year, Ryanair had hedged 90% of their use, year's fuel needs at the equivalent of $77 a barrel, right? Air France KLM, had hedged more than 90% of their needs at the equivalent of 78.50. Lufthansa had hedged 75% of their needs at 63%. Now, that might not mean or, or be too significant for you, but that's just three companies, right? Ryanair alone, on the Ryanair hedge, they're looking at a losing $300 million. Air France are looking at a billion dollar loss on that hedge, right? And that's just three companies in one industry. If you multiply that by the whole planet, all the hedging, all the speculative positions from the investment and trading industry, there's a lot of really big positions out there and they, they don't need to have to adjust much to really hit our markets, right? So if you're sitting on a multi-billion dollar position, that is actually a pretty big motivation to react to a news event if you think it's got a good chance of pushing your position off site, right? Now, as you mentioned earlier, institutions that hold massive positions, they can't just get in and out in one go, right? So you can't just say, right, I'm gonna sell 50,000 oil futures at market, right? Your fills are gonna be terrible and you would crash the market, right? So what's initiated is a sell program that might take all days, it might take a few days, it might take a few weeks. You get out but by minimizing the impact on prices too much. 
you can't have zero impact on prices when you're doing something like that but it's better to move the market a dollar a contract than fifty dollars a contract right now different news is going to bring in different levels of urgency and it's balanced with the fact that you know dumping buying or protecting a position in one go is going to result in poor prices but it does happen sometimes we saw with covid the way the market just tanked right everybody's just running for the doors right that's not really what situational awareness is about and it's not really what taking advantage of the news is about it's really more about the slow and steady moves that get created so, but anyway this is the reason that when you see kind of a like like after the FOMC if they've changed interest rates you're going to see that in, initial like 30 minute 15 30 minute spike but that's not the whole reaction right that's just that initial flurry of trade um, and news, we know that news doesn't just go from one price to another with a rapid jump. It creates nice, long-lasting moves as long as those positions are being adjusted. Now, sometimes, like with the COVID moves, sometimes the reactions are going to be so volatile, it's just really not tradable. You know, you need a, you need a big bank to trade it. Now, the reaction to news, it's not going to just take marks in one direction either, right? So, generally speaking, a news-driven move is volatile. And it's going to go up and down and that's why a lot of people scale into positions right to kind of protect themselves at the, at the start um so you might end the day on a big news day you might end the day right where you started right but it's going to bring in participation with some degree of urgency um there's no reason to think that you know a news driven move on crude couldn't drive it up three dollars and then back down three dollars right just keep it simple initially all you need to have on your mind is this is the market reacting to something right now do we have really motivated buyers and sellers whose moves we can piggyback? Or is it just going sideways and there's nothing going on, right? It's not very difficult to do, right? Now, the other thing is, it's not just about news, right? There's a lot of patterns that evolve in the market in cycles of when they put in their moves and when they calm down. Uh, most traders observe this and take into account to some extent, um, holidays, for instance, have been uh, traditionally holidays, like the Christmas holiday, the, the Thanksgiving holiday, the summer holidays. They, they've kind of seemed less important the past few years, right? But the traditional holiday slowdowns might come back, right? But just, you know, if we're going into the next summer holiday, or, you know, if we do have a summer holiday, right? As we go into the next summer holiday, we're thinking about two things. We're thinking about, well, you know, traditionally the market's going to slow down. But like past couple of years, it really didn't, right? Things like the markets pick up at 9.30 New York time, but a couple of hours later, they tend to be a bit slow. It's lunchtime, right? It's basic stuff, but knowing what times the action is, is all a part of being aware of where the opportunities like to be. Technical factors like the VIX, market depth, pace of market, allow us to kind of fine tune our interpretation to kind of confirm those reactions. Now VIX is a really interesting one used to be and again this is a pattern that's probably not relevant anymore used to be when the vix went over 24 all the market depth on the s p futures would disappear right it was kind of like an on and off right the vix rising over time is often indicative of institutions feeling that really all's not well with the economy right like you know we've seen for the past 10 years there's been a massive build-up in corporate debt there's a corporate debt bubble and um you know the vix was rising ahead of uh, covid um, and we still we kind of seen a bit of the knock-on effect of that debt bubble now. Um, VIX is just something to keep an eye on, right? If it's gradually rising, then expect more volatility. If it's stuck down at 12, expect it to be very slow without news driving the markets. You know, you can see um, the, the the shift up. Sorry, you can see uh, where we got the. You know, we can see the shifts up here in 2018. Um, shifts up again uh, at the end of 2019 with COVID, right? Um, then we've got something a little bit different. Massive, massive spike, right? Um, that's the spike that we saw in the previous slide. If we go back to that one. We can see the VIX was rising there, went up to 30, just towards the end of mid or mid November. And look at it, look at that move there. It's virtually invisible, right? So VIX is extremely high uh, or has been relative to historical norms anyone looking for a measure of whether the markets are back to normal can get their answers here right just take a look at the VIX um, at this point this is a month ago um, still wasn't back to normal we know that the liquidity hasn't really come back into the markets yet it has slowed down a lot but it's still really high historically I mean this is what we're used to trading 
right? This is the volatility we use for trading, and I'm not sure where we are now. Um, I haven't checked it today. I should have probably slotted in a screenshot. But you know, if we're if we're if we're in the 30s, that's historically very high, right? So when this happens, right, what do you do? Well, if you're going to expect more volatility, you've got to use the sort of techniques and stop losses that work for that volatility. So if you're trying to use stop losses that worked in December, they're obviously not going to work now. And that's just a simple change to make, right? Um, just to so you don't get stopped at a trades when it's more volatile. Then the amount of depth in the order book, right? So if the depth suddenly disappears, then maybe there's some news you didn't hear about. So go and check your news feed again. Or maybe we're about to get an economic release. So it's not just a coincidence that people just pull all their orders at the same time. So if you see all the depth disappear from the market, from the dome, you need to have a look at what's going on. I and mean, if you've just gone into a long position and the depth goes from this to this and you're two ticks away from your entry point, you're really risking staying in that trade, right? There's, there's something that you don't know. There's something the market knows that you don't know, right? Longer term reduction depth is also usually associated with longer term macro news like Brexit and COVID. So it's not so much the news, like we got a story like Brexit. It's not so much the news that makes the creative volatility with Brexit. It's the fact that anybody can say anything at any time that sends a, the market into a tailspin. Angela Merkel can just come out with a comment that sends the market into a tailspin. So you, you basically got consistently higher news risk. So but anyway, so if the depth disappears, check your news feed, but just make sure you're aware of what the depth normally is. Okay. So if you know over time that, you know, I mean, there used to be a time where we'd see a thousand a level and more on the S&P and now it's in the, the low hundreds. Um, you know, if you see less debt, you just know news can hit any time. Market makers take less risk. Um, risk comes from the fact that any time it's possible that news can come in and hit the markets hard. Now, as you return to normal and the news goes away, this should return to normal too. So this is before COVID, the typical debt uh, on the S&P 500, and this was at peak COVID, right? So one of the things you look at is, is the debt returning or the market makers coming in, okay? And the key here is we're looking for really obvious things, right? So these two images are just months apart, left before COVID, the right middle of a global lockdown. You don't need to get your calculator out and look at this stuff. You know, you get most 200s on the left, and if that changes to 300s, probably not going to be a lot of difference. If it changes to 500s or 1,000s, you're going to see the market slow down, okay? On the right side, if it's at 10s, you're going to see more volatility, right? So it's pretty simple stuff. Then the pace of the market, right? If you're watching a market every day, pay attention to the pace and the volume trading. How is it moving around, right? Is the S&P futures, like at peak COVID, it was screaming up 10 ticks and down 10 ticks all the time, right, within seconds. Right? Or is it just marching up a few ticks a minute in a nice orderly manner? Because you can't approach the two types of markets with the same strategy. You at least need to have different stops. Right? So the key things to look at there, number of contracts traded to move to each level, the pace at which the market moves up and down through prices. Then you kind of got the wiggle, like what's the kind of, what's the, what are the sweeps up and down as it's progressing? So normal S&P can sweep up, up and down three or four ticks as it moves in one direction. And it's not a pullback, it's just kind of like the wiggle, uh, the, the volatility. Um, the, the wiggle's not a pullback, it's, you know, that's a larger counter move, it's just that kind of sweeping up and down action. And this is where you're gonna see behavior, cha behavior changes playing out. There's not a lot of skill to it. It's just a matter of keeping an eye on the same, an eye on the same thing every day and just recognizing that it's changed, right? And also understand that you can't approach the market on the left here the same as one on the right. Right, we can approach them the same. Many people do. It's just a guaranteed to, way to fail at trading. Right now, this isn't what, the way a lot of people want the markets to be. They want the markets to be something they can approach with a single method, based on the least information, with a guarantee to make the money forever. And the problem is, this is how the markets really are. So all the shortcuts in the world that you're trying to avoid this stuff, you'd be much better off just kind of you know grabbing the bull by the horns and just and just starting to use it. Now. A slightly more difficult to explain, but quite easy to see, is the concept of recent, recent activity, recent behavior. Okay, so there are times when everybody's happy. There's not a lot of news in the market, but it's just climbing over time. I mean, the market's been climbing for 10 years, right? You know, the whole of the last 10 years, the market's been climbing. We've had some pullbacks, but it's just been a, a real churn up. Um, but during that time, the markets didn't put in a new high each day. 
with a one-way move. We got ups and downs. We saw patterns evolve. Sometimes those patterns lasted weeks. Sometimes those patterns lasted months. Uh, my own uh, bugbear is the periods we have where all the move happens in the European session. Sometimes it's because of news. Um, you know, you look at the overall range for the day, which looks good, but then you look at the US session, it was really poor. As I say, sometimes there's, there was news behind that, but a lot of times we just had these great moves overnight in Europe. Everyone's thinking, well, Europe moved 40 points. Let's sit down and trade the S&P today, and it moves like eight, right? Um, that kind of thing, again, might sound silly, but pay attention to those things, right? It's very easy to see if you look for it, but you're looking for those patterns, right? Is all the move happening in the Asian or London morning every day? If so, you get a big move in the European session, what do you do when you get into the US session? You, you start setting your expectation, okay, this might be a slow market. You know, I can't, you know, we might, we're in that phase where these big European moves aren't playing out on the, on the US markets. Uh, sometimes the market opens up the same way over and over. Um, sometimes the day's range is consistent for weeks. Uh, sometimes it's the size of the swings up and down. Uh, sometimes it's simple stuff like a successive series of inside days with reducing range. We've all seen that. We open Monday, Tuesday's inside Monday, Wednesday's inside Tuesday, Thursday's inside Wednesday. So the game is looking for that eventual break and being patient on those low opportunity inside days. So the markets do fall into patterns of behavior and don't be afraid to make assumptions based on how we've behaving recently to how we might behave today, right? So how do we actually incorporate this kind of stuff? Well, step one is maximum 15 minutes, I would say, when you start. Just look at the headlines, look at what's scheduled today, make sure you've got a note or an, an alarm on if you've got a Google calendar um, of when the unscheduled meetings are going to be. Um, look at the overnight moves if you trade the US. What's going on generally? It really pays to look at um, some kind of precious metal, uh, some kind of energy product, interest rate product, currency product, and index future. Not because you're going to trade them, but just because it's good to see where the action is. Okay. So you want to know what's going on. What events are on schedule today that might cause a change in volatility? Have the markets been behaving a certain way? over the past few days. Maybe we open at 9.30 and by 9.45, it's dead, right? How are we gonna know if that's repeating today? Can we take advantage of it, right? The ste second step, which is really important, is write down what you think, right? Where do you think the volatility will be today? Is it indices, gold, interest rates, crude? Um, did everything move already? Um, what's been the norm of late? What, what scheduled events might shake the market up? So don't get caught up trying to guess the direction, right? because we're not playing that game. Chances are you're gonna see moves in both directions anyway, right? So, you know, you, saying today is gonna to go up is kind of a bit silly if you trade an index futures because it's probably gonna go up and down, right? But just try and, active, uh, try and anticipate the type of activity you might see. Okay, are we gonna see uh, a market that's gonna run? Have we got something on the calendar that could really hit this market? Which market should it hit? Is it gonna hit gold? Is it gonna hit crude? And then watch the markets Keep an eye or an ear on the news. Look at how the markets move. Is the order book for the market heavier or lighter than usual? Is volume high or low? How is it moving? Is it yet another inside day? Are we coming, up, coming to the point where it's going to break? If you see an unexpected change, go and see if some news came in, right? Then you trade or you back off. After all, this is what it's all about, right? We don't try and guess direction with this stuff, okay? There are people that specialize in it, but that, no, that's a whole trading technique in its own right. We just want to know an idea if people are actually reacting to news, right? So maybe we just trade as normal. Maybe it's just a day where there's a nice bubbly amount of uh, um, day traders in. We trade a pullback. We trade a couple of breaks. We just trade as normal. But maybe we scale into a position because the market's really moving and it looks like it's reacting to news. Maybe there's absolutely nothing going on. The market's flat. We're in the same space we've been in the past three days. And the most likely outcome of your trading is losing money. And maybe you're not 100% sure, like a lot of guys in the prop shops, they don't know if it's really a low opportunity today. Sometimes they just get into a position and just see it's really lackluster and give yourself a, a max free losses rule and, and just end the day before you, you know, don't ruin yourself on it. Then at the end of the day, just have a look at how you did. So what you're looking at the end of the day, not so much on the trading performance, but on how that initial hypothesis played out. Right. So if you said, right, I've got a big news on Brexit today, 
I'm expecting the S&P to be really volatile, and it wasn't. That's just a lesson learned, right? Um, you know, did you see the participation you expected? Um, you know, did you react to what you're seeing, or did you trade even though there wasn't really much opportunity? And this basically is how you improve, right? You're closing the loop. You're always comparing what you estimated might happen at the start of the day with what really happened. And over a few weeks, you'll see how the market is actually a lot easier to trade at some times than others, right? And those are the times you need to pile in with the cash a little bit more. And you'll also become comfortable working with the information um, that helps you understand you know, what mode the market might be in. And that is it, right? This is not something we want to overcomplicate. There are just really three things you're trying to achieve by adding this to trading. The first is to tell ahead of time if your strategy might fail because there's no interest in the market. Second thing, to take advantage of the times the market is giving traders more opportunities to make money, right? So if there's a big news movement, it's going to last all day, throw some money at it, right? That's what it's all about, is trying to get those big days. And the third is proceed with caution when the market is reacting so violently to news that it's just become a really dangerous trade right move to micros just just do something different because there's a lot of people who are, are trading one lots as it is and they don't kind of have the the ability to scale in so you're going to have to go to a micro contract to, to to play that real that real high volatility to be honest i don't like it i don't like that kind of covid volatility i just think it's it's craziness um but in the professional world basically the way it works in the professional world you know nobody's good from day one right even with like the professional education right so the education is usually about 25% theory, 75% hands-on. And their improvement comes from the hands-on. That's how they improve. And the difference in those guys and most trades at home is they just have that process of improvement. So the education is going to get to the novice stage. The process of improvement is that what's going to push you behind that, beyond that. So every day after trading, those special traders will go over their trades. They'll consider their mistakes what they did well they'll consider look at if they're closing trades early and they might make like a if they're if they're consistently closing trades early they might make that their focus for a few weeks until it's full which is why as you have a daily process right the most important thing if you're going to do anything like that is always comparing your idea of how things might play out with what actually happened if you don't close that loop all you're doing at the start of the day is saying well these are the things that might affect the market. I think this will happen. But at the end of the day, not really going back and saying, well, I was right there and I keep getting that one right. I'm really good at that one. And this one here, I'm really terrible at it. I mean, I'm, I'm terrible at predicting volatility in crude. But actually, on S&P, I might be good. And you can actually do more of what works and less of what doesn't. So it's really important if you try to adapt more things and actually use them in your trading to somehow close that loop to ensure you, you keep moving forward and you know where your actual predictions are lousy and where your predictions are good and you can work on them and improve because nobody gets to trade a thousand lots on futures without actually having spent a lot of time on their own development right so i don't know any trading educator that trades a thousand lots and i do know trading educators in prop firms but i do know people they train that trade a thousand lots and the difference is that these guys are working in the education, the prop firm, and the other guys have got have, have taken that education and then they've grown with it. So with this, if you decide to do it or some part of it, just make sure that you don't just use it, you actually have some kind of process to check how good you are, right? Check how good you are at predicting. And with that, Terry, I've finished my fairly simple presentation. Okay. All right, guys, if you have any questions, type them to the questions box and I will ask them to Pete. Terry, did you get that link for the Bloomberg newsletter? Yes, I posted it in the chat. Yeah, because that, that is really, really useful. Let me see real quick. Actually, it looks like it didn't do it as a link. Okay, there it goes. It's posted again in the chat. Okay. Uh, can we, can you email me a copy of your slides so I can put in the uh, thread? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right, I'm waiting to see if there's any uh, more questions.
Okay, I guess there's not. Well, that's good. Kind of uh, saves my voice. It is 4.30 a.m. Okay. I uh, thank you for the webinar, the information, and for spending some time this evening and or early morning for yourself. All right. Thanks all. And uh, I will send the slides in a minute, Terry. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers.